Hello, I'm Dan Sweeney, the director of the Institute for Enterprise Ethics here at the Daniels College of Business on the University of Denver campus. I am pleased to present the fourth edition of the Institute's quarterly ethics review. This program features several outstanding faculty members from the Daniels College of Business discussing a number of the most interesting and widely reported stories from the world of corporate ethics and responsibility from the previous three months. In this session, we will talk about the gender discrimination issues in Silicon Valley. We will talk about the uh, Starbucks Race Together uh, campaign. We'll talk about the payday lending industry and the minimum wage and on-demand workforce issues and, and several other important stories. My colleagues for this discussion are three outstanding members of the Daniels Business School faculty. Dr. Doug Allen is Associate Professor in the Management Department. Ruth Jebby is Senior Lecturer in the Business Ethics and Legal Studies Department. And Ali Besharat is Assistant Professor in the Marketing Department. So colleagues, let's get into it. So Doug. Recently, Ms. Ellen Powell lost her gender discrimination suit against Kleiner Perkins Venture Capital Partners in Silicon Valley. The case was brought by her alleging that she was denied a promotion because she was a female. Meanwhile, the sexual harassment and sexual discrimination cases are still going on in Silicon Valley on Facebook and Twitter and Tinder. Uh, What's, what, why is this all, all occurring kind of now and in this place, uh, Silicon Valley, presumably the home of the ultra with it high tech meritocracy? Mm -hmm. Well, why not <laughs> is the, what I would say to that. Uh, Silicon Valley is famous for technical innovation, but uh, not particularly well known for social innovation. Occasionally, organizational structures are of interest to take a look at. I think there may be several possible explanations. You have young, predominantly male entrepreneurs who may not have been trained in diversity by either their families or their uh, schools. And as a matter of fact, they may not have been trained in systematic business approaches. And both of those, either one uh, represents sufficient reason to have, expect to have trouble uh, in the companies they represent. According to a diversity expert in Silicon Valley, uh, a firm can aspire to be meritocratic or inclusive but that requires real work, including an earnest examination of workplace culture that can be inadvertently biased. And we see a lot of evidence that not a lot of effort has been put into this. Uh, Silicon Valley is famous for its frat house culture and the tech bro kind of behavior, as well as the Dave rule. Uh, the Dave rule is simply the rule that you have gender uh, equality if you have as many women on the team as you have men named Dave. <laughs> and so with those kinds of jokes floating around, you're, you're, you know, you're in some trouble. I think that you can look at that individual level of behavior as well as a more uh, uh, institutional level of behavior. We find that businesses having all male teams are more than four times as likely as companies with even one woman to receive funding from venture capitalists. Uh, investors. Uh, in a recent research uh, piece, uh, Babson found that 6% of venture capital partners were women down from 10% mm. in 1999, and yet those companies with uh, uh, VC uh, female partners were twice as likely to invest in female uh, companies and three times as likely to invest in uh, female CEO run uh, companies. And so you have a lot of uh, a lot of evidence that, uh, uh, that there is sort of institutional level discrimination as well. Perhaps women are just not as effective as men though, we could say. Well, the research shows the opposite, <laughs> that uh, companies with the highest proportion of women board members outperform those with the lowest proportion. Uh, companies founded by women are more capital efficient. Uh, female founded startups have lower failure rates and VC backed companies founded by women experience a 12% higher rate of return. So that one doesn't really work as, a, <laughs> as an explanation. I think moving forward and maybe where this conversation could uh, lead is uh, looking for solutions and approaches that might help us as we, as we consider this issue. The good news is that uh, aside from ethical considerations, the, the talent shortage is going to force people 
to uh, begin looking more carefully at uh, people from many different backgrounds and, and, uh, and, and both genders as well. There's nothing like a talent shortage to discourage discrimination. <laughs> and uh, we can find that uh, as an example, uh, Salesforce, Salesforce, the company CEO, Mark Benioff, who announced, he announced that he would review Salesforce salaries and award raises to women who are making less than their male colleagues just spontaneously to be sure that they would eliminate any kind of uh, gender pay uh, issues. Family-friendly policies are becoming uh, more prevalent, uh, flex time, uh, job sharing, and uh, maybe truly honoring the uh, family medical leave act and other kinds of things like that. And as a matter of fact, taking it full circle back to Ellen Pau, she is now the interim CEO at Reddit, and she's announced that they will no longer negotiate salaries as uh, people come into the organization. Uh, research shows that women are less likely to negotiate uh, tough uh, salaries, and, and so uh, oftentimes, uh, inadvertently, companies uh, develop uh, multi-tiered pay scales based on uh, simply that tendency. Women who negotiate are perceived more negatively than men who negotiate, and so you lose twice uh, in those kinds of things. So why Silicon Valley? I'm, I'm not sure that Silicon Valley is more guilty uh, than other parts of our society, but I am certain they're not less so. And uh, the challenge moving forward, in my mind, and we'll see what others think, is to really begin seeing how we can eradicate these uh, forms of discrimination for the good of the individuals as well as for our society. Um, I would like to make a comment on that uh, great overview of the industry, mm -hmm. but um, putting label uh, in terms of gender discrimination for Silicon Valley may not be a very uh, correct term for that industry because um, even like women um, outnumber men in different industry, look at business, look at medicine, look at law. Um, but when you come to the tech industry, we have only less than 5% of women that they have, um, they work in this industry, and less than 2% of them, they have the tech-related uh, degrees in that discipline. So is it because of our education system that we don't train enough, uh, um, let's say, self-confident um, uh, women that they could go to this industry and they could do well, um, like Marissa Mayer, that uh, all of us know about her, but um, our education system, basically, we have lack of talent. That's why Silicon Valley cannot hire those people that they, they need to be represented among women to have like equal opportunities for both genders. I just open up this for mm -hmm. the panelists. Uh, yeah, I, I'm really interested in this conversation sort of at the institutional level, um, and that's probably partly because I'm a lawyer, so I think about things from an institutional level. But it raises the issue in term, uh, for me in terms of, so what do education institutions do? So we know that this is happening. We know mm -hmm. that we probably made some progress, but not lots of progress. So what do we do, for example, as a business school? to help educate our students before we send them out into those VC jobs or out into those corporate jobs to think about these issues in a really constructive way. So for example, as we're putting together teams for team projects, you know, do we actually think about the dynamics, especially the gender mm -hmm. dynamics in the teams, and do we actually have conversations with the students? I know that I'm at fault for not really addressing that issue with students and having those conversations to get that mm -hmm. issue onto the table. So maybe we need to think about, you know, um, pulling, sort of pulling back the camera mm -hmm. and thinking about our role as educators in trying to prevent some of the horrible symptoms that we're seeing out in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I, I think that's a very important part of the mm -hmm. Uh, puzzle is to figure out how we prepare people who are heading out into the into the field. I th for me, one of the th discussions I have in my classes is how the U.S. is perceived to be a leader in the field of gender equality, but is actually not so much once you begin looking mm -hmm. at the uh, statistics, whether it is as a country being a signatory to some of the United Nations mm -hmm. Uh, treaties uh, that dis uh, 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 that uh, 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 prohibit discrimination mm -hmm. against uh, women, or whether it's the actual legal structure that uh, begins to uh, encourage more family-friendly uh, policies in the organization, or or whether it's the behavior of individuals, as we've been talking about as well. And so, uh, you know, it's not uh, uncommon for some students to say, well, that was something that was a problem a generation ago, but our generation is different. I think there's a lot of evidence that it is not so different, and so it is an issue that needs to be continuously addressed, not just, by the way, gender equality, but also racial equality right. and a number mm -hmm. of other important issues that uh, creep up in the workplace uh, from time to time. 
And I think that, um, I mean, even though she lost at the court, it kind of opened up the whole area mm -hmm. for discussion mm -hmm. of right. uh, whether it's fair or not and whether right. women are underrepresented in that industry mm -hmm. or not. So I think mm -hmm. that was worth it. So that's why you got a, a lot of media coverage. So yeah. probably she was the winner if you wanted uh, to test that in a uh, public op opinion setting mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, court kind of setting. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there, there's no doubt she was a very courageous woman to, to actually bring the suit exactly. against a firm like Kleiner Perkins. Mm -hmm. So, uh, cheers to her. Thanks. Great, uh, great conversation. Ali. So, uh, late, late in March, uh, Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz under heavy criticism from uh, segments of the public, the coffee drinking public, and from some of his employees announced the end of the most visible component of the company's Race Together campaign. This was the effort that encouraged your favorite barista to engage in conversation with you on the sensitive topic of race relations while you're ordering your latte. Uh, this is not the first time Schultz has taken on a, an important social issue as a corporate cause. So here's a question. Do you think large public corporations, well-known public corporations like Starbucks, have a right, much less an obligation, to promote such causes that happen to be pet projects of the CEO? That's a great question. Um, I would like to just give a little short background about um, supporting social causes. So um, most companies, uh, they have two routes for supporting social initiatives. One is corporate social responsibility that either they provide um, funding or resources to uh, support certain causes, or um, the other method is improving their own products or processes to help the uh, env environment and sustainability of the environment. Um, but the problem is they're reaching a point of diminishing return. And uh, they cannot be as profitable with those initiatives that they, they used to be in the past. So people either, they don't notice them or their effectiveness are gone away. Mm -hmm. um, so companies try to shift gear and move toward more other initiatives that I like to call them corporate social uh, advocacy. So their intention has nothing to do with their core business. So we're, mm -hmm. they're trying to, um, Take, uh, take his stance on uh, controversial social issues. It has nothing to do with their mission or their co uh, core business, but they just want to, um, you know, make a statement and uh, go viral. Because um, there was a survey that has been done recently by um, gro a global strategy group, and they mm -hmm. found that uh, in, in 2015, 56% of consumers preferred the brands actually to take a stance about mm -hmm. different social issues, even though being uh, controversial. So it's, it shows that a lot of brands are moving toward that direction. Even though they may lose some of their potential segments, because obviously not necessarily everyone in the segment are going to agree uh, with those statements that the CEOs may, uh, may uh, put out there. But obviously some other customers uh, may uh, give credit for this kind of brave and uh, motivated um, you know, social initiative that they launched. Um, and uh, it's so interesting. I was looking at Huffington Post 2014 report. 27 major companies actually supported uh, this um, corporate social advocacy mm -hmm. only for uh, same-sex marriage in the last mm -hmm. year. So it shows that a lot of companies are moving toward that direction because they want to get noticed. And customers want to also identify themselves with those brands. I mean, they see them as a citizen. They want those to make a statement. It's not just uh, saying that, okay, I'm great, buy my product, but I'm taking a stance about this um, subject and I want to stand with me with this you know, subject. So I think that the intention of Starbucks, going back to your question, I think the intention was very good. I have some issues about the execution of, uh, of that initiative that we can talk about if the panelists, they have any comments to add to that and we can come back to it. Well, you know, I, I think one of the issues for me is if you think about how do you actually get, for example, the employees of the company to buy into this cause, I think to the extent that it is a pet project of the CEO, to me that seems problematic, mm -hmm. um, A, in terms of execution. And clearly I think that was one of the issues with Starbucks. Ali, maybe right. you can speak to that as well. But also in terms of, so, you know, how do you actually build a culture within the organization that is supportive of mm -hmm. social initiatives? It's not by top-down imposing your view on mm -hmm. your employees, it's by finding out what's important to them, what's critical to them, what matters in their lives, 
and then percolating up from that what those initiatives sh should be. So, you know, my issue with it is sort of Howard deciding this is what mm -hmm. we're all about, mm -hmm. not finding out what Starbucks should be all about. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because uh, one of the executives, as soon as they launched this campaign, uh, so a lot of people got upset uh, because they thought that this is not a, a, a topic that you could discuss over a cup of coffee with a barista. <laughs> and they were not comfortable, you know, during that transaction. Mm -hmm. And so one of the executives' Twitter accounts uh, was flooded with a lot of negative comments about this mm -hmm. initiative. So he decided to shut down his Twitter account, which actually kind of backfired. And right. people say, okay, if you launch these you know, initiatives and after two, uh, two days, one of the executives shut down his Twitter account, it's not a good sign that you're all committed to this cause. Going back mm -hmm. to it. So I, I would uh, add, though, that I would differentiate between the, the concept of a company taking on an issue and the analysis of the execution in the case of this particular mm -hmm. uh, example. Uh, uh, Howard Schultz actually visited the University of Denver about two years ago and made a very interesting point. He said that, you know, with uh, limited uh, governmental budgets these days and, uh, and also just a decline in uh, societal uh, involvement in a lot of these issues, mm -hmm. it was increasingly on the shoulders of companies to kind of take up the slack and make up for some of that. And so I think that there, there's a fine line. I, I totally agree that you, you want to build the culture mm -hmm. within but also at times you may want to initiate issues that uh, that can be embraced uh, by the broader uh, by by the broader uh, set of employees and and uh, so I, I for me it's not a clear cut case where uh, it can only be uh, something that is building the reputation of the company at times I think there's a legitimate need to take a stand right. at times those two come together nicely and taking a stand builds the reputation of the company those are kind of no brainers. The, the tougher question, and here I think is really where what I call social responsibility, mm -hmm. is where you take a stand even when it may be contrary to the mm -hmm. short-term needs of the organization. You know, you know, it, it seemed to me that um, a guy like Howard Schultz, mm -hmm. whom I have great respect for, uh, you know, has so many passions about so many social issues, mm -hmm. it would be hard to pick one mm -hmm. that's not a pet project of his. <laughs> so, That's probably true. Right. Excellent. Uh, another excellent conversation. Uh, yeah. thank, thanks a lot. We've got a question that came up from the audience, Ali, and it was uh, regarding something that you, you said with regard to companies who invest in social causes uh, that are kind of at the core of their business strategy as well. Could you give us a couple of examples of that? Yeah, I have two that comes to my mind. One is Hotel.com that has started uh, supporting a social cause to force the government to give, give the minimum uh, vacation days to their employees so they could go on vacation and th these are the requirements. Another example that comes to my mind is uh, the brand Always, that they try to take a stance uh, against discrimination toward girls. And this mm. is kind of tied with their core business. So they're in the same business, and this is important cause for them to support. Mm -hmm. um, Starbucks itself is actually engaged in cause-related mm -hmm. initiatives as well. Um, if you mm -hmm. think about the way that they construct their um, supply chain and the mm -hmm. way that they work with coffee bean farmers to actually adequately secure that supply of coffee beans, but also to make sure that the farmers have living wage and can make a go of their farm. So Starbucks itself is actually worked at causes that are directly directly related to its core business. And you could add to that Starbucks approach to their employees. Recently another controversy was the fact that they just extended their tuition reimbursement mm -hmm. for college from mm -hmm. two years to four years and uh, under sort of an aggressive interview Howard Schultz was asked you know what about your shareholders you know uh, don't you owe some of that tuition to the shareholders and Howard Schultz's answer was very interesting. He said, you know, I think we, we, we absolutely take our shareholders very seriously. We're a company with a market cap, I think he said, of about $70 billion. Uh, He says, our shareholders have done very well, and we need to share some of that success with our employees, which comes back to help Starbucks in a number of ways. They have, I think, a turnover rate of about 30% compared to other fast food chains that sometimes experience 100% or even 300% turnover a year, and you notice the difference when you go into a Starbucks. Uh, they set the scene for employees who are ready to serve. Yep. yep. Ruth, um, over the past quarter, a great deal has been said about and written about lo low employment rates, uh, low minimum wages of uh, underpaid and underemployed workers. 
and, and about the rise of on-demand workers with such companies as Uber and uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Meanwhile, in reaction to the increased uh, need for entry-level workers, companies like McDonald's and Walmart and Gap and others have independently raised their entry-level wages. Now, this employment situation does not seem, at least to me, to be very, a very rational way to build a viable and stable employee base for economy and economy, especially one the size and scale of ours, nor does it appear to be an effective way or a fair way to organize a workforce. So there's not really a specific question in here, but I'm really curious <laughs> about what, what the three of you think about this situation that we find ourselves in. Um, well, let me start by saying I'm conflicted about the situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to spitball out what I think are maybe some of the issues to think about as we think about what's going on with the way we construct workforce, and then hopefully Dan and Ali, you can help us, or Doug and Ali, you can help us think it through. Mm -hmm. um, I think to start with, you know, on the Walmart issue, it, it's pretty easy, I think, to look at Walmart and, and see them as a free rider on the social contract between them and the United States government. Um, their low-wage workers are essentially being sort of subsidized by government stipends because they're not making enough money to actually live on. So I think at the low end, it's pretty easy to see that there's still a fair amount of regulation that's needed to help those workers. Um, you know, regulation in the labor field is based on unequal bargaining power between mm -hmm. employer and employee. And we may like to think that that's been eradicated. And in some areas, maybe it has been, but there's still a lot of folks that cannot adequately protect themselves in the workforce. And they need the protection of government. That's where government steps in. So I think, you know, we need to rethink minimum wage, for example. We need to get really serious about what does it take to actually support a family in this economy? And we need to make sure that folks have that. Um, the other part of it, though, I think that's kind of interesting is to look at what's going on with how we define the workforce and how we define the labor force. Um, you know, I came of age in a, a generation where the labor force was really built around, you know, sort of paradigm stereotypical American family. Two parents, dad worked, mom took care of the kids. And we built our concept of what the workforce should look like, I think, based on that sort of social paradigm, but we have social different social patterns now as well. We have different kinds of families and we have different people with different kinds of needs. So I think that think about um, the effect of Uber, the effect of TaskRabbit on that low wage workforce. Are they actually luring employees away from Walmart? I think that's a really, really interesting construct to think about. Is that going to force Walmart to have to become more competitive in terms of their benefits and their compensation? But at the same time, you look at these companies like Uber, like Lyft, like TaskRabbit, are they providing opportunities for workers who cannot find a place in the traditional workforce? So think, for example, of a uh, stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad who left the workforce for six or seven years to raise kids. Kids are now in school. Mom or dad can go back into the workforce, but they still have to be home by 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, and the workforce can't accommodate that. But TaskRabbit can. <laughs> TaskRabbit can make that work. So, you know, one of the issues I kind of see in thinking about our workforce is I think there are folks who've been, there's talent that's been left on the sidelines. And maybe these entrepreneurs are finding ways to bring that talent back into the workforce. So I don't know. I'd be interested in hearing what others think about this. For me, this was an issue that I had not really thought about very closely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I see those uh, second group as like in independent contractors, that they uh, come up with their own time, come up with their own schedule, and also they can decide how they're going to get paid. Like even Uber uh, drivers could decide whether they're going to drive during the rush hour or after midnight because the rates are different. Mm -hmm. Whether they want to pick up someone in front of the stadium or they want to take someone to the university. So again, the rates are different and the mm -hmm. flexibility, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the problem that I have with this structure of the uh, payment is if you're working under the name of Uber or Lyft, mm -hmm. are you supported with that company? Mm -hmm. you, do you get the enough benefits that you deserve from that company? And if you don't, then there's a problem. 
because they could take advantage of you, mm -hmm. they could abuse okay. you. There are a lot of uh, complaints about Uber nowadays because um, they say that if you have ratings less than four, by default you're going to lose your job. And they never look into why, what happened that actually you earned four out of five in some mm -hmm. cases. As opposed to that, they just get rid of you and ask uh, right. someone else to take over. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that we're right on the cusp of needing to totally rethink the concept of employment. Uh, and that, that has to do with the policies and the legal mm -hmm. structure as well as the relationship between employer and employee. On, on one hand, we need to have regulations and laws that prevent exploitation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, we need to <coughs> recognize that some of these new structures are offering opportunity to people who may not have had opportunity in the traditional economy. Mm -hmm. And so how do we balance those two uh, values of opportunity and uh, avoidance of of exploitation. It seems to me that if we go back a uh, hundred years, we would find that uh, the United States had about 70 percent of the uh, employment uh, in the agricultural sector. And if we were to say to those people at that time that if we fast forward a hundred years, it's between two and three percent that are employed in the agricultural mm -hmm. sector, we would have said, where are all the jobs going to be? And yet, in the same context, we have uh, under six percent unemployment by the current measure mm -hmm. of the government, even though we have these new technologies that have radically transformed the way that we, that we work. Uh, what we need to do is catch up uh, with these technological advancements so that we can take advantage of the benefits they offer without allowing some unscrupulous people to uh, take advantage of the employees that will be part of that system. You know, the interesting part about that, too, I think, is it has not to do only with technology, but with business models. Mm -hmm. So you see, even in the on-demand, you start to see different business models. So Uber and Lyft work very differently than TaskRabbit. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. TaskRabbit is much more about, I'm going to help you build your business, independent contractor, and I'm going to provide you some of those safety nets that you m would have access to with a traditional employer. And so mm -hmm. I think we're starting to see that on-demand economy sort of identify, so who's the market segment to drive for Uber? That's going to be different than mm -hmm. those who work for GigWalk or those who actually work for TaskRabbit. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're starting to see different business models there as they respond to the needs of those workers. And I think, for myself, I think that's hopeful. Mm -hmm. You're starting to see a little bit of flexibility and some real thought. Um, you know, the issue with um, Uber and Lyft and the other folks who are, have been involved in lawsuits, I think, um, unfortunately creates a gray area for this mm -hmm. industry as well because it's not entirely clear legally how they need to operate. So if you're an entrepreneur thinking about how to move into this space, you have some strategic decisions that you have to make in a context of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, I, I think some really interesting stuff happening in the field of employment. I think just one other thought is uh, the assumption about where the benefits come from. Uh, maybe something that needs to be reexamined right now. One of the reasons that you go for contract workers is you're not responsible for providing the benefits that are there, which provides a great competitive advantage over companies that do have to deliver those things. And, and so the debate is kind of framed around there, whereas I think maybe a broader societal debate mm -hmm comes in and says, is, is the employer really mm -hmm. the place that should be providing those benefits or should it be through various other kinds of institutional uh, mechanisms more similar to what we see perhaps in the Scandinavian uh, countries, a much thicker social safety net uh, that makes employees much less dependent on the benefits they would receive from employers. And also the transparency in sharing economy. Like a lot mm -hmm. of uh, users or drivers who sign up for Uber, for instance, they think that they're going to make more money by using actually mm -hmm. this service as opposed to getting em employed, getting a full-time job okay. with Walmart or Target. But they never take into account the cost of depreciation and maintenance right. and gas. So even though the, the rate of pay for Uber has been uh, promoted to be $19 per hour, so you, yeah. because you can say you make 19 hours, but when you right. take out the maintenance and other cost of the depreciation of your asset, probably you make around like eight or nine. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people right. have like short term for quick cash kind of view of right. uh, this business, but in fact actually they may sacrifice the mm -hmm. potential health uh, insurance or other right. like perks that other full-time jobs may offer that mm -hmm. these contractors right. may not ever That's receive from Uber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the other point, too, is, you know, we're all business folks, right? So you think about, you know, when something new arises in the marketplace, that's usually a signal that there was a gap, right? Mm -hmm. That there was a need that needed to be filled. And so, you know, maybe we think about the sharing economy as, so what's the need that it's, that it's appealing mm -hmm. to? Mm -hmm. Because if it doesn't fulfill a need, it will go away. Mm -hmm. But that is some signal that there's something wrong with our um, current employment system. Mm -hmm. so. 
and there appears to be something uh, very right from a customer or a consumer standpoint of these of these new businesses. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Great conversation. Thanks. Panel, uh, late in March, the Con Consumer Financial Protection Bureau proposed uh, new regulations to rein in the short-term, sometimes called payday loan industry. Companies in, in this industry offer short-term, short low face value, high interest rate loans to consumers who are badly in need of cash but have no other source of credit um, to go to. Um, even though the borrowers are truly in need of the cash, the loans are often are all, almost always considered predatory uh, because of the high interest rate and the high likelihood that the loans will be rolled over a number of times, resulting in an, an enormous uh, debt. Um, the, the question for you is how how can the industry, the the, the payday loan in, the large industry, um, and the bureau uh, come to some kind of agreement or compromise that provides a source of needed credit? for these consumers, uh, but does not take unfair advantage of their circumstances. I, I think that issue is very similar to the question about uh, Uber and, <laughs> and such, that, that at the end of the day, we have uh, a need for the opportunity for people to access uh, quick loans from time to time uh, to uh, address emergencies. On the other hand, we want to be sure that we avoid exploitation of some of the poorest people in our society who are most likely to be taking advantage of those uh, services. Uh, and so I, I don't have specific insight into this from the standpoint of what would be the appropriate uh, loan uh, uh, rate of return or anything. Uh, there's the issue of risk and, mm -hmm. and uh, people need to be compensated for risk, risk, but I think maybe that's another societal su assumption that needs to be re-examined. Uh, uh, do we always uh, require the highest rate of return from the poorest people? Somehow that just seems very perverse. Uh, we see that same thing in the context of multinational investment. The highest rate of return is demanded from the emerging markets that oftentimes are the poorest locations in, in the world. So that whole paradigm may need to be examined, but at the same time, we want to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. At the end of the day, there is a need for access to capital, and there is a need to compensate the people that are providing that capital in a fair way so that they can do this in a way that uh, meets their expectations as well. Yeah, I think, um, so when you look at this industry, I was thinking that because the interest rates are very high, I was assuming that it's a very profitable segment of the industry, mm -hmm. but in fact they're not actually. When you compare them to the regular uh, mortgage or loan um, a facilitator in this industry, actually their return on investment is really low. So they have an average of 7.6% return on investment, and the mortgage industry and the loan industry is typically 13.4. So actually it's uh, relatively non-profitable compared to the rest of it. But I think the notion of having high interest rates and the segment who are borrowing from these sources not knowing the numbers, so the financial uh, uh, literacy I think is a very mm. critical issue that they have to educate consumers. So at least there is a sheet that they could put in front of them that if you default on this loan for three times, you're not going to even be able, based on your paycheck, what you showed me, that you're not going to even be able to pay off that principal. You just mm -hmm. keep paying the interest rate of the uh, you know loan that you borrowed. And um, in terms of the regulation, I think government should step in and uh, provide some guidelines. So, okay, the maximum amount of loan that you could take out should be, for instance, $500, and you cannot uh, roll out more than two loans a year. So at least you know that if they are defaulting or rolling over to a new, a new loan, there's not going to be a third loan because there's no way based on the financial um, a capability of consumers to pay that off and uh, be able to get over this loan. So I, I think this is very critical for government to educate consumers in the first step and also put uh, clear guidelines how actually consumers could take out these loans and uh, hopefully they could pay it off by the end of the year. So I find this phenomenon kind of fascinating too. Uh, you know, it sounds like uh, the high default is, is one of the real issues with mm -hmm. this sort of category of folks. So I wonder, I was thinking about this as you were talking about interest rates for multinationals and emerging economies, Doug. Um, are there lessons to be learned from, the, from our experiences with microfinance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As we think about how microfinance institutions have worked to develop mechanisms to prevent default yeah. so that they could mm -hmm. then 
lower, as the risk went down, mm -hmm. they could mm -hmm. then lower the interest rates. Mm -hmm. and, and so maybe we need to really think about how we lend money really quite differently mm -hmm. than we do at the upper end of the economic scale and take some lessons from, you know, Grameen Bank and from mm -hmm. some of these other organizations that have had some success in lending money to those at the lower end of the economic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And also the pre-qualification requirements for these types right. of loan. This is another thing that uh, unfortunately a lot of lenders, they're not picky about it because actually th their profit is there. But they have to have some pre-qualification. So do you have a, like a title um, for your car? Do you have a property that in case you default you could sell that property? Or do you have like an asset that you could right. you know hopefully pay that off? But unfortunately, they just uh, give away these loans, and mm -hmm. like right. like consumers, unfortunately, that segment in the market default, and you know what happens? Mm -hmm. They keep rolling mm -hmm. yep. uh, this debt over and over. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it seems it seems to me that some of the measures that the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is proposing, which which you've la laid out, could at the end of the day be be have a positive effect on on, on the industry. Be because it will put discipline right. on their pre-qualifications, on the on the size that this these loans can get to, the number of them they can take. So they'll be forced into a much more disciplined way of doing business. And one of the reason the profitability of this segment is not high is because the default rates. Right. And a lot yeah. of customers could not pay it. So the interest rate can go up to four hundred percent. APR, which is unbelievable when you consider the annual part mm -hmm. of it. Uh, but uh, if the government step, uh, steps in and they provide some guidelines, obviously the risk of those investment goes down. So they could sure. get their money back and probably it's, it's even it's going to help the industry. So not only the consumers, but also the industry to make it more mm -hmm. vivid and active. So how in the world do these interest rates get up to 400% per annum on a single loan? And given 400% per annum, how come these payday uh, loan companies only generate 7% as a return on investment? Doesn't math, how's math work? Yeah, because when you think about the traditional interest rates or APRs, they're on an annual basis and they're on compound basis. So every month you default, it, uh, it accumulates interest and then you pay interest on top of what has already been accumulated. Uh, but when we think about this type of loan, the payday loans, um, so it's tied to your monthly payments. So every month you have been charged certain fees. So if you borrow like $100 and there's a $15 fee, if you borrow like $200, it's going to be $30 fee. And as soon as you default on that loan, so the, for the first loan you cannot pay it off, that amount has been added to the first principal. And then you add an additional fee on the money actually that you're responsible for. So. From that aspect, that's why we get the 400% interest rate, because it's compound and it's on a monthly basis as opposed to the annual interest rate. Uh, but from the standpoint of why it's not profitable, 7% versus the norm of the lending industry being 13%, is because of the default rate and the risk ass uh, assigned and associated with this type of industry. Like um, Almost like 60% of people who t take out money, they cannot pay th that loan off. Right. So they keep defaulting and the lenders obviously cannot get their full money back. And that's why we have the 7% return on that industry. I think two other quick points. One is uh, that these are very small scale loans and so the administrative uh, costs associated with that loan is amortized over a very small amount of money as opposed to a mortgage for mm -hmm. a $400,000 house or something like that. And so the cost structure for these loans, like in the microfinance industry, mm -hmm. are much higher per dollar loan than you'd find in, in other circumstances. On the other hand, I, I still do not doubt that there is a predatory uh, aspect to this industry and I also seriously doubt that the true return they're experiencing is as low as 7%. Well, but the, the, the fact remains, though, that this loan goes out, and as Ali explained, it grows up to 400%. Nothing has been paid back, and then within a few months or maybe a year, the, 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 the loan has got is this huge loan, and it's got this 400% rate on it, and the borrower defaults. Mm -hmm. So the, so the lender doesn't get the 400%. Right, right. It's the worst of both possible worlds, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. Another question for whoever wants to take it, uh, take the lead. On April 5th of this year, uh, Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times, columnist of the New York Times, uh, wrote a column about a, a recent Princeton uh, philosophy graduate 
who, who took his ethical obligations to society very seriously. Yet, he took a job as an arbitrage trader uh, on Wall Street. And so Christoph, Christoph uh, was, was curious about this. In Christoph's words, quote, that's because he took a high-paying job in finance so he could contribute more to charity. Sure enough, in 2013, uh, this trader uh, donated more than $100,000, uh, roughly half of his pre-tax income to charities. Well, in my view, this is, this is surely an interesting case to just contemplate. Uh, what, what, what thoughts does it bring to you um, regarding ethical and responsible behavior on Wall Street? You choose. All right, I'll be <laughs> So when I, when I first read about uh, uh, this young man and read Christoph's article, uh, you know, there's a, there's a part of me that against her goes, yeah, you rah, give away that money, donate to charity. Uh, the, the question that it raised for me, though, is um, do we rely too much on charitable donations to try to fix social problems in the world? And can we donate our way out of those kinds of problems? I would argue not. And um, what I would love to see this young man doing is a living his ethics in his job making sure that as he's trading on Wall Street, he's actually trying to be that positive influence on the industry, that he thinks about what's the part that the financial sector plays in contributing to those problems and what can he do about it. And then, you know, thinking more broadly about what are the sort of systemic causes of the problems as he, that he's donating to sort of Band-Aid. Yeah, give away the $100,000, but don't forget we have to look for root causes. The 100000 isn't enough. I, I actually don't see any conflict in this case. Uh, I think it's a false dichotomy to say that we either have to be of service or work on Wall, Wall Street. Uh, mm. I think I would prefer to see an ethical person on Wall Street helping to influence the culture there and maybe trying to uh, change the overall approach that is there. And so we don't know what he's doing in his job, but I'm open to the possibility that he's actually having a beneficial impact on society in the context of his job himself. Uh, what he donates to charity is another uh, uh, opportunity uh, for service. What he does in his free time is, is a third arena. And so I think that oftentimes we make false dichotomies and we say we either have to be of service or we have to do our job or you know, we have to be good to our family or good to our job. We have all these different kinds of dichotomies that we create. And, and as we move forward, we really need to begin thinking in a more coherent way about how we live our lives and how society expects behavior out of its citizens that really allows opportunities for service in all arenas. Yeah, I have uh, two concerns in this case. I shouldn't call them concerns, just two comments, quick comment about this. One is the opportunity cost, as you mentioned. What if uh, he would have invested this $100,000 on something else or set up an account that actually after a couple of years, it's gonna grow and it's gonna help more charities or more causes. So that's one opportunity cause issue that probably he did it just because he's new there. He started his job two years ago, so he's learning that probably in the future he's going to have a better long-term perspective over there or he just want to make a buzz about himself that, you know, this is my philosophy and that's why I'm doing it. The second uh, thing is the charity of choice. How do you choose uh, those charities? Do you go with the one that actually is close to your heart and you think has the highest impact? Or do you go with the one that publicly people think that it's uh, the most uh, rewarding one and in terms of the impact is more powerful than your charity of choice? So it goes back to actually whether choosing a charity is better, more impactful, or actually being given a charity by someone else or by public actually what might, might be more effective. So we can have that kind of conversation about that topic too. You know, my, my reaction to this um, was that um, my preference would have been to see him take that 100 grand uh, that, this year and maybe 150 next year and so on and invest it in one of his firm's hedge funds <laughs> and leave it in there cranking away uh, for uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. And then by that time, he could maybe pull out $100 million and do something of real substance. With that, mm -hmm. so I agree. The hundred, you know, hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars, a lot of money, but when you're trying to cure uh, health care <laughs> or poverty, um, 
you know, it's it's a nice token, but that, that's kind of what it is. And it, I, I think, though, that, uh, for me, we're micromanaging this guy too much. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> Probably I, so. I, I think yeah, uh, he's a kid. I, I'm going to give him. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to give him uh, the benefit of the doubt and assume that he is motivated to do some uh, some good. And there are many ways he could do that. Uh, uh, charities need donations uh, now as well as in the future and and there is also the opportunity that you could uh, create a nest egg and make some kind of bigger impact later. I think we need both short and long-term kinds of mm -hmm. orientations and I would prefer to see everybody really looking for their own way that they can be of service and validating every one of those ways as uh, very uh, very uh, true and, and valuable contributions to society. Yeah, I was. I didn't mean that as a criticism, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I just happen to be a guy who likes scale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and scale is very important. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, here's a new question. Uh, it, it's new because uh, the issue just appeared uh, last night and was reported in the papers this morning. It's Deflate Gate, and the issue we want to bring up here has to do with the general uh, culture that we find in NFL teams and maybe throughout the, the entire NFL. Uh, the, pa the New England Patriots were found more likely guilty than not of deflating their, their footballs during the run-up uh, game to the Super Bowl. There's some, uh, uh, some evidence this is a cultural thing because the Patriots are known for pushing the edges of things. Uh, just like the uh, Miami Dolphins in their toxic locker room uh, culture ended up in a young man uh, leaving the team and leaving the sport. Uh, and it's just like the New Orleans Saints a number of years ago with their bounty uh, on uh, dr driving opposing uh, players off the field uh, by injury. Uh, the, all three of these issues are, are cultural in, in those organizations, the toxic cultures in that organization. So the question I, I might pose here is, is there something about uh, this sport? Is there something about this league? Is there something about this whole uh, activity of um, you know, uh, young, man, young men behaving badly uh, that, that needs to be addressed through kind of an ethical lens? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I've read only the very first sort of news headline that came out last night, so I'm probably under-informed on this. Um, but for me, it raises a couple of different issues. I, I think one of them is this really broad issue of what we as a society and as fans are prepared to let professional sports franchises and professional athletes get away with. Um, we, I think we love as fans to sort of become irate in the moment and go, yeah, yeah, damn those Patriots. But then we tend to forget, right? Once training camp starts, all of this is going to go away. No one's going to be talking about deflate gate anymore. And that, I think, allows an unethical culture to, to persist because we don't root it out sort of at the roots. I think the other part of it that's interesting to think with, about with regard at least to the NFL is sort of what's the regulatory structure over the NFL? What's the role of the commissioner? Could the commissioner be doing more? He was on the hot seat over the last couple of years as well with players who were accused of domestic mm -hmm. abuse and child abuse. And mm -hmm. did he do enough? Did he have appropriate processes? So the NFL regulates itself to a huge, huge extent is it doing what it needs to do to adequately regulate itself? I would say, yeah, no. The commissioner needs to step up his game. I think this goes back to our very first question, the, you know, the issue of the Silicon Valley culture and mm -hmm. the tech bro sort of uh, thing and what is acceptable and what is not. Our society seems to give a pass to certain kinds of people for very, very objectionable uh, behavior that normal citizens would not be allowed to engage in. Uh, my uh, very rudimentary understanding one day out uh, after the release of the uh, <laughs> report is uh, that they say the preponderance of evidence shows that not only were these balls deflated purposely, but that Tom Brady was uh, part of the deal. I've said throughout the investigation that if it was proven or shown uh, that there was institutional support for this, uh, then the Patriots should lose their title as Super Bowl uh, champions, and that's what I would say is appropriate at this point. Uh, even if there wasn't the institution of the company behind uh, the team involved with this, I think Tom Brady is close enough to the top that he sets an example for the entire team, and uh, nothing less than removal of the title and a very severe sanction for him 
should be the result of that. Because if that does not happen, that sends a signal to everybody in society that cheating is okay. And that gets us back to Silicon Valley. A little discrimination here and there is okay. Or it gets us back to some of the other issues that we've talked about uh, throughout this hour. Uh, we, we absolutely have to look at uh, the choices that we make as setting precedents for the behavior far beyond the incident itself. When we were doing the, uh, the conversation about the Miami Dolphins, one of the arguments, not arguments, one of the observations that came up was uh, professional football is inherently and naturally an extraordinarily violent activity. And with violence comes the, the degeneration of order and discipline and regulation. And so we kind of ought to expect uh, violations of what would otherwise be natural um, human behavior, standards of behavior, uh, because these are young men in a violent game. Mm -hmm. if, if that's true, then we need to get rid of football. That's right. And hockey. We all start playing soccer, right, Ali? Right. Yes, a lot of other sports. <laughs> I mean, and I think there's a difference between what we can expect if you look at cause and effect mm -hmm. and what we're prepared to tolerate, mm -hmm. what we're prepared right. to accept. Those are two different things in my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my, my expectation, and, and we'll find out whether I'm right or wrong pretty, pretty soon, mm -hmm. is that uh, the family that owns the Patriots and the coach, Belichick, and maybe even Brady, who has not turned over his cell phone yet, may have plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. You still got this, this young man, part-time employee, only works home games, who, who took, actually took the balls into the bathroom after they were tested and got, brought them back out. So we, you know, I think I know, I think I have a good idea where this one's going to end up. Anyway, uh, good, good uh, ad hoc responses. We got some good perspectives on that. Thanks.